the first cause argument. We've been going through the book, Who Designed the Designer? Um, written by Dr. Agros. Full titled, Who Designed the Designer? A Rediscovered Path to God's Existence from Ignatius Press in San Francisco, just out this year. The reason we've been discuss discussing it is not because he, this is something new and strange, but rather because this is a particularly good discussion of a position that's quite common. The book itself is available at Kindle and Nook, and it's an explanation and defense of the argument from the existence of causes to a first cause, which turns out to be the first cause. And um, if you don't want to buy the book, there's a couple of uh, websites that you can look at trying to, um, trying to figure out uh, what the general uh, run of the argument is. Uh, we're gonna, we have already discussed the argument, to which I am sympathetic. Uh, is there at least one first cause was the first week. The second week was the properties of the first cause. And now we get into philosophical problems, scientific problems, which we'll kind of consider together because they're intertwined with each other. Theological problems. And then kind of putting it together at least my way. Um, so that's the subject for this week. Uh, as an aside... Usually at the end, I'll have a place that's my take, but this is going to be my take all the way through. So um, I, I will, of course, quote people, but, uh, but uh, this is kind of, uh, this is all pure editorial rather than uh, presenting material and then editorializing on it. <clears throat> you may remember that his, in his introduction, he, he stated that the certainty reached in this book, his book, is greater than that attained in science-based books for and against a designer. And the reason why is because it involves deduction, not induction. Deduction being premise one, premise two, and the conclusion inevitably follows. Whereas induction... Um, as uh, we'll, we'll get into that in just a minute, uh, the, arguments in a the argument in a deduction, of course, the logic itself is sound, but if the premises are unsound, you're in trouble. So the argument is only as good as its premises. If the premises are wrong, the argument may be perfectly valid argument, but it's incorrect anyway. Is the moon... If the moon is made out of green cheese, then there's lots of oxygen on the moon. The moon is made out of green cheese, therefore there's lots of oxygen on the moon. You know, it's perfectly logical. Except that the moon isn't made out of green cheese. And in fact, the conclusion is correct. There's lots of oxygen on the moon. It's bound up in the rocks, but it's there. But it's not because the moon is made out of green cheese. Uh, another example of uh, an example of an inductive argument which he gives is mushrooms are carbon based, flowers are carbon based, trees are carbon based. And he could have said DNA based instead, it would have been just as true. Bacteria are carbon based. Horses are carbon-based, therefore all living things are carbon-based. And of course, you know, you can multiply more and more and more examples if you wish. And he points out the problem with that inductive argument is that the conclusion doesn't follow from the premises precisely. There was a time when all swans that were ever seen, regardless of where they were in Europe, were white. Then somebody went to uh, Australia, and they have black swans there. They're all black. So much for the rule. 
But, he says, not all general statements are generalizations. I have not inspected every instance of the number six, yet I am convinced, and so is everyone I've ever met or heard of, that the general statement, every six is even, admits no exceptions. I'm not worried that someone in Australia has an odd six in his pocket somewhere. So, he wants certainty, and you can't get it from induction, so deduction is the way to go. The problem that we have is that Agros, how does he go about establishing his premises? Well, let's look at confidence that there must be a first cause. That for uh, one of the underlying arguments is that there is not an infinite chain of causes. That the causes have to stop somewhere. And uh, particular examples, as he said, will put out the re uh, will bring out the reason. And he gave the example of a lamp suspended by a chain, which the chain goes up to something, and that's the end. It doesn't go on out for infinity. Uh, train engines and cabooses. That if you want to move a train, somewhere in there you have to have an engine. That just stacking more and more flat cars in front won't do you any good. And he says, in the interest of brevity, I limited myself to two examples. What's he doing here? He is proving his premise by induction. All of a sudden, the vaunted certainty that we have goes out the window. Because his argument is just as much an induction as anybody else's. Now, I'll grant that many more examples could be adduced to prove his point. But the argument to a premise is either every example I've ever seen is this way, which is the inductive argument. Sun come up yesterday, the sun came up the day before, the sun come up. You know what? I think the sun will come up tomorrow. Um, or I can't see how it could be other than this way. And sometimes I think we're right, but sometimes we miss that last one. Or, of course, you can argue both. All the examples we have, and it does seem like there's no way around that particular problem. The former is inductive, and the latter is really kind of a form of an argument by axiom. Both, in fact, are fallible. And that means that deductive arguments are fallible. Now, it's worse than that because in the case of Aristotelianism, major postulates have been shown to be wrong. So Aristotle got it wrong. And in fact, Aristotle had several principles, one of which is that motion requires a cause. And another one was that heavier objects fall faster than lighter objects. But we'll get into that one later. Unfortunately... In Galilean and Newtonian physics, motion doesn't require cause. What requires a cause is a change in the motion. And what's even more interesting is that Aristotelianism fought Galileo tooth and nail and um, wound up getting him embroiled with the church. And by the way, uniform motion in a straight line um, being the natural, um, uh, the natural condition of things meant that the earth could move and we wouldn't necessarily feel it. Because as long as it's uniform, it feels the same as if we're standing still. So it's essential to the question of whether the earth moves. This is not a minor disagreement somewhere. This is fundamental. And that is the lesson of Galileo. Aristotle was not completely correct. Now, as to the causes that he talked about, one of the things he says is that circular causation is really ridiculous. But you can have two bodies that are linked. 
They can be linked physically, they can be linked gravitationally, or they can be linked electromagnetically, and they will orbit each other, each being the cause of the other's change in direction of movement with precisely opposite influences on each other. And they can do this indefinitely, except for the electromagnetic attraction, which will gradually radiate um, energy away and then uh, finally wind up uh, collapsing in on each other. But it goes on for a long time before it quits. One can even imagine a satellite a little more distant than the traditionally geosynchronous orbit. Why a little more so that it exerts a little pull? With the light cable hanging from it, reaching down to the Earth upon which one may hang the lamp, in Agros's example, and we have a skyhook. Now, it will only work at the equator, and it might not work at the Earth at all because there might be enough uh, uh, Roche, uh, it might be in Earth's Roche limit and therefore get torn apart. But if you get a small enough uh, planet, you could make it work, depending on how fast the planet's rotating. Um, but the fact that it could work at all destroys the simplistic argument to a first cause. Now, I say that as a person who believes in a first cause, but I'm just not sure this is the way to demonstrate it. Circular causation is not only possible, but is in fact relatively easy to demonstrate. All of our planets, all of the satellites that are going around Earth are demonstrating uniform motion, not quite in a straight line, curved around the center of, uh, of gravity. This is contrary to Agros, who says pure circular causation is obviously impossible. You can't be your own father, for instance. You can't give your own existence to yourself or receive it from yourself. Um, well, actually you can. And in fact, it's kind of interesting because you could say God is his own cause of existence. The first cause looks like it gives existence to itself. But anyway... Now, I'm not opposed to a first cause. In fact, I believe in one. But the premises used by Agros to argue for one are not correct. And Agros is not alone in this. I'm not picking on Agros because I dislike him. It's just the theory is standard Aristotelianism, and it's wrong. The premises used by Agros to argue for, uh, for a first cause are not correct let alone self-evident, and therefore his argument is in fact less rather than more certain than those of intelligent design. Now, in addition, Agras insists that the first cause must be simple. I'm not sure that we can make that philosophical demand of the first cause. In fact, making philosophical demands has a long and uh, somewhat ignoble history in philosophy. People thought that they could think this stuff out without looking at nature. They were wrong. The history of science is, in fact, a struggle against such demands. And if you want to know, it's not really science versus the Bible. It's really science and an ossified Aristotelianism. I rather suspect that Aristotle himself was a lot more flexible, and if you gave him more information, that he might change his way of looking at things. But after it had been for two or three, or two or two millennia or thereabouts, a little over, well, actually just about exactly, um, after it had been about two millennia, um, his defenders had kind of lost that kind of flexibility of thought that enabled Aristotle to come up with his ideas in the first place. This is pre too precisely of Aristotelian philosophy. The concept that motion required a mover was opposed to Galileo's concept of inertia, which was later expressed in Newton's first law of motion, that an object tends to continue moving in a straight line unless a force acts on it. The idea that heavier objects should fall at the same rate as lighter objects was anathema to Aristotelians. 
because Aristotle had said the heavy objects file faster. And then everybody knows that a hammer is heavier than a feather, and so you drop them, and the feather takes a lot longer to go down, right? Well, of course, that's air resistance. The fact of the matter is if you take a small lead BB and drop your hammer, they'll fall at just about the same rate. And in an interesting experiment that I have seen with my own eyes, you can take a feather and a, a piece of lead shot or whatever and put them inside vacuum tubes and turn the vacuum tube upside down and they fall at exactly the same rate. They did it on the moon, but I saw it, I saw it in, the, in the Chicago Museum of Natural History before they ever got to the moon. Aristotelians didn't inherently dislike observations, by the way. Aristotle, one of the things he did was he said, if you want to know what the real world is like, you have to look at the real world, which is different from Plato. Um, but they just didn't like it that the observations contradicted their philosophy. And that is <laughs> maybe true of more of us than we like to admit. <clears throat> Agros and others like him are attempting to turn black the clock. Now, you can only do this if you explain why the clock went forward in the first place and that that was illegitimate. I don't think that this can be done successfully in this case. So I think that there's huge philosophical and scientific problems with the first cause argument. I think it would be better to adopt a philosophy where science is recognized as being particularly useful in recognizing the underlying nature of reality. The philosophy of science is, at, at least in my opinion, best exemplified in the works of Imre Lakatos, but there's other people who are very close to him would argue that the best one could hope for concerning a given proposition, for example, the proposition that God exists, is that its truth is likely, given the evidence at hand, that you're not going to get 100% certainty. That the search for a philosophy that cannot possibly be wrong is a fool's errand. This view by the way, can be traced back to Thomas Reed, a contemporary of David Hume and an opponent of David Hume, according to the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, and there's the website that you can find it at. Um, I'm going to read a few uh, uh, passages from it. Reed's prescient, long-lasting contribution to the history of philosophy and religion, after he had said he argues for God in pretty much traditional ways, um, concerns the way he shifts his emphasis as apologist from proving God's existence onto the task of showing that it is rational for one to believe in God's existence. Which I think is all you can really say. It is of interest that Thomas Reed, in addition to being a trained minister, lectured in Newtonian mechanics and was apparently quite competent in science. Perhaps an understanding of science is necessary for an adequate philosophy. And I would suggest that it is even necessary for an adequate theology. Hence the book I wrote, Scientific Theology, which is available uh, to read for free on the internet. Now, that's the philosophical and scientific problems that I have with the way that... Uh, was argued by Agros and company. I have theological problems. Now, I'm going to have to give an apology for why I'm using theological problems. And the reason I'm going to, the reason I'm going to do that is because there is a common way of thinking that we always proceed from observation to theory. Therefore, we should always proceed from science to philosophy to theology. That means that theological problems with a well-established scientific or philosophical theory are problems for the theology, which is just going to have to accommodate the science or the philosophy. Well, in one sense, I agree with him. That is, that observations, when carefully enough done, 
are always the final court of appeal. And by the way, we as Adventists believe that. Otherwise, we would believe that Jesus really did come in 1844 and we just didn't see it. However, good theories can sometimes make predictions that prevail against the apparent weight of other evidence at the time. I'm going to give you some examples. Neptune's discovery. When the planet Uranus was first spotted, it didn't follow a precisely Newtonian orbit. And some people were tempted to say, well, Newton was pretty close, but he wasn't exactly right. And so what, they, what some people said was, well, Newton's just, you know, the theory is wrong. And what other people said was the theory is actually right. The problem we have is we haven't seen all of the planets yet. So they said, if there's a planet that's right about here, weighs about this much, it would account for the abnormality in Uranus's orbit. And sure enough, they looked there and they discovered Neptune. That was a big feather in the cap of uh, Newtonian mechanics. There are things like time warps that um, relativistic theory predicted that time would slow down a little bit as a rocket was accelerating, and it would slow down a little bit more as the rocket was speeding rapidly, but it would slow down less because the rocket was now weightless. And figuring out all of that stuff turns out to precisely predict what we have to do to molecular clocks, uh, cesium clocks to be precise, to make GPS signals from satellites. It works. It works exactly. And you wouldn't have believed it if you'd followed common sense. Laser light. Another example. Until quantum mechanics predicted it, nobody would have ever believed that you could get coherent light traveling as far as you wanted it to, pretty much. And yet, we all now know that it, it happens. Perhaps one of the more interesting ones is the Bose-Einstein condensate. Um, that is a prediction made by Einstein and another fellow by the name of Bose, who said that you should be able to overlap the waveforms of atoms. Now this gets weird but you can actually stack millions of rubidium atoms, if you cool them down enough, into a single a point that is basically the size of one atom. And you're going, you can't do that. Actually, you can. It's based on theory, and nobody would have ever thought to look if they hadn't had the theory. As a matter of fact, the computer that I'm working with right now, your cell phones, all of those things have electronics that are based on quantum mechanical theory that would not have been apparent to any, anyone before. Um, we're discovering more and more how much reality is stranger than we think. As some wag said, it's not only stranger than we think, it's stranger than we can think. In fact, theology can make predictions of that same kind that are verified by science that weren't expected at the time. Um, I'll call your attention to the Loma Linda Blue Zone. You may remember a lady by the name of Ellen White that commented on the harmfulness of tobacco, meat, etc. And you know what? Even though there was no physical evidence for it at the time, that was at least obvious to the rest of the, or the scientific community, she was right. And those of them who opposed her were wrong. 
and it can be proved. Footprints in the Coconino Sandstone were looked at by somebody who had a different perspective from the standard one, arrived at because of theological beliefs that said, if you look at certain things, you should find different conclusions from what you are expecting. And sure enough, those footprints look like they were formed underwater and not in sand dunes. And the evidence behind that is really quite convincing. But you wouldn't have looked if you hadn't had the theology pushing you to look. The Yellowstone Fossil Forests were at one time thought to be produced by 300,000 years of tree, ring gro of tree growth in situ. The sign put up by the National Park Service has been changed to reflect that they were done quite rapidly. You would not have expected that if you didn't look at things from a theological point of view. Carbon-14 and fossil carbon, one that I'm personally acquainted with, I know that I'm not the only one to have done this, but there are other people who have made a, that prediction that there should be fossil carbon, in, or it, fossil carbon in, uh, could contain fo uh, carbon-14 and that it should be looked for. And when we looked, we found it. For that matter, carbon-14 in bones from the city of Nineveh. Um, were looked at specifically because of a kind of theory as to how carbon-14 dates should relate to regular dates. And the prediction was borne out. Now that one, we're still collecting data. But the point of it is that theology can make predictions. Now, this is where I'm going to have to ask, but I suspect that coral growth rates were looked at specially by someone who was looking at things from a short age perspective and ask the question, could they grow faster than they are growing at present usually? Am, am I correct in that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there are cases where they grow very rapidly. And the point is that it's fair to take theology and go into science and ask the questions. This can, I, I have not, I don't think, exhausted all of the examples one can give. I'll tell you, the, the history is replete with examples like that. Um, which means that it is appropriate to consider theological difficulties when considering a philosophical question. The flow is not all one way. This concept will be resisted by empiricists, but it's nevertheless right, and the empiricists just need to get over it. Now, having said that, I'm going to say there are theological problems with the conclusions that are reached by Agros and those like him. The God that is arrived at by Agros' method has no dimensions, has no motion or any other change, that God has an utterly simple mind, and it is reasonable to say that nothing we do really makes any difference to that God. That God cannot be combined with anything else, because it is the first cause and the only first cause, and if there is extra stuff, well, then that's not the real God. The real God is behind that. This raises several theological problems. How can that God be in heaven in any special way? How can that God grieve over his erring creatures? Because that implies motion inside of the God, or at least change. How can that God be a trinity, three in one? It's got to be pure, simple, and dimensionless. How can that God be existent in the man Jesus, who actually was physical, flesh and blood? How can Jesus be human if his human side is swamped by the divine side? Now, these are not just theological difficulties. 
uh, theoretical difficulties, they resulted in church councils that tried to resolve the philosophical and theological impasses. And while the church councils didn't get rid of all Greek philosophy, um, one can take the conflict, uh, uh, one take on the conflicts is, I, I think it's uh, Jorge Fernandez wrote this, uh, that the church council simply stated the theological truth and implicitly or explicitly assumed that the philosophers were somehow forcing wrong-handed choices on theology. Is God one or is God three? He's both. Is God, is Jesus have a divine nature or a human nature? He has both. Well, does it sometimes the divine nature rules and sometimes the human nature rules? No, they're both there all the time. And if you're going, that's not fair, I urge you to consider, is light a particle or a wave? As C.S. Lewis said, good theology has got to be at least as complicated as modern physics and for the same reason. One take on the conflicts is that the church council simply stated the theological truth and implicitly or explicitly assumed that the philosophers were somehow, uh, I'm sorry, if the philosophers are always right elsewhere, one could argue that the theologians were in error here, you know, we just, uh, we need to adjust our uh, theology to philosophy. But we've already seen that the Aristotelian philosophy did not fare too well when in conflict with science. Now, might ask the question, does the Bible have anything to say about philosophy? Actually, it does. The Greek word philosophia, philosophy, is used only once in scripture, and that's Colossians 2, 8, and I'll give you the quote. Beware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Not terribly complimentary. In fact, what's even in more interesting is, whose philosophy would they be talking about? The dominant philosophy, Aristotle and Plato. And just to kind of nail this, the basic principles of the world are the Stoicheia to Cosmo, which in some renderings turns out to be the four elements, fire, earth, air, and water, which of course are Aristotelian. The context of Colossians 2.8 talks about Christ being before all things, being the fullness of the Godhead bodily. You can't do that. And being the one in whom all things consist. These are all philosophically charged ideas that might be disputed by Plato or Aristotle and are related to the concerns of later church councils that we referred to earlier. It is interesting that Thomas Reed makes use of two arguments for the existence of God. Um, again, quoting from the Stanford um, Encyclopedia of uh, Philosophy. First, Reed's treatment of arguments for God's existence is for the most part unoriginal and freely makes use of the ideas of many previous Christian thinkers along this well-worn trail. Reed's cosmological argument stems from Samuel Clark's and, and features a priori justification of the principle that whatever begins to exist must have a cause which produced it, which is another argument which I find a little bit more sound than the, than the one um, about the first cause. Reed defends this against a, a few attacks association, associated with Hume. For example, if Hume's skepticism about causation undermines this principle, you may, you may remember we discussed that a couple weeks back, Reed says that many everyday inferences would become unjustified. Reed uses this principle in a cosmological argument, but only as recorded in his lecture notes, which leaves much to be desired. So we don't know exactly what he had to say about it. Every being must be either contingent or necessary. We call that contingent, which might either, which either might or might not be, and that necessary, which must be. Whatever either might or might not be depends on the will of some agent with power to bring it to pass or not. Reed is then recorded to argue that to suggest that the supreme being ex exists contingently evidently would be absurd. 
Interestingly, for our purposes, he does not here discuss the unintelligibility of a one-directional infinite series of contingent causes or a circular series of contingent causes, possibly because he realized that uh, with Newtonian mechanics, the latter is expected. Reed gives the design argument more discussion. The design argument? Now my ears are really perking up. One first principle of necessary truth is that design and intelligence in the cause may be inferred with certainty from marks or signs of it in the effect. This is an unusual principle to denominate as a necessary metaphysical truth because it is an epistemic thesis about what is permissible for one to infer. He, uh, Reed, labors to show that this is a necessary first principle by saying, for example, that it is too universal to be the effect of reasoning. The first necessary principle serves as an opening premise in the argument, to which Reed adds some empirical data. The second premise says that there are, in fact, the clearest marks of design and wisdom in the works of nature. From these two premises, Reed concludes that the works of nature are the effects of a wise and intelligent cause. Sound like an argument you've heard before? Now, this is where it gets really interesting. Uh, or Actually, uh, no, it'll, it'll get interesting. It's interesting already, but it's, it'll get even more interesting later on. To the single case objection often credited to Hume, that is, we only have one universe, so how can we know? We haven't seen designed and undesigned universes, so how can we know that ours is designed? Um, that the design argument is not cogent since this is the only universe of which we are aware. Reed replies that the objection is built on the supposition that our inferring design from the strongest marks of it is entirely owing to our past experience of having always found these two things conjoined. But if Hume's criticism does pose a problem for the design inference, it also undermines our belief in other minds. This is because Reed also does not witness the intelligence of another person bringing about some effect. So in other words, if you're not going to believe in God, then why, uh, why should you believe that I'm talking to you? That, um, that I'm really thinking these thoughts? The first principle of necessary truth, licensing information from signs of, in, in, of intelligence to intelligence, pairs with another that states that belief in other minds is also a first principle. In other words, Thomas Reed said, you know, don't give me this stuff about I'm the only person around. <laughs> uh, in that case, you're imaginary. Reed knows well how these two work together, and as a result, he unambiguously foreshadows the epistemological parity argument to be found in Platinga's, Platinga's God and Other Minds. Now, I'm going to back up a little bit because this is discussing something else but it mentions the design argument in passing and is extremely interesting from our point of view. The three arguments for moral liberty. In the third argument, I'm skipping over the first two, of course. Um, in the, the third argument for moral liberty, which is the most obscure of the three, Reed claims that a person could not engage in planned conduct if not endowed with power. He's trying to prove that that power is part of, uh, the, the power of choice involves the power to actually make things do what you choose. Um, since it's obvious, he's, he thinks, that we do engage in planned conduct, it follows that we must have power over our actions. Reed links the third argument for moral liberty, that's, that is free will, with the argument from design for God's existence. And again, my ears parked, uh, perk up. According to the argument from design, God must exist since the world is so complex and yet so orderly that there must have been an all-powerful, all all-knowing being who designed it and made it according to plan. Similarly, Reed argues, planned conduct is at once so complicated and so orderly that there must have been some author of it. He then claims that since it is obvious that we think up our own plans, we must also execute them. 
So he thinks we must be endowed with power. That is, we have free will. There, now, watch the objection. There is room to object not just to the third argument, but also to the argument from design by noting that ordered complexity can arise through mechanisms other than a guiding hand. Most of us think, for instance, that the mechanisms of natural selection result in the production of enormously complicated and yet ordered biological structures, like the human eye. Whoa! The thing I want to impress on your minds as we're going through this is not just, uh, not just to introduce you to the argument, but also to ha have you realize the centrality of the argument for intelligent design. If natural selection is causally responsible for the human eye, then there is no designer of these structures who efficiently caused them. We don't need power in read sense in order to execute our plans. We just need to be the sort of creatures whose minds are hooked up to their bodies in such a way that they do what they plan. I'm not sure that that isn't precisely what power is, but um, whatever. It could be, that is, that by forming plans, we engage powers that are not our own by engaging laws linking plans with execution, laws of which we are not the authors. I'm not sure how that's an effective distribution because when I came here, I didn't come under my own power. I drove my car. But I think that that doesn't destroy free will. Um, this is a powerful objection, according to the authors of the Stanford Encyclopedia of uh, Philosophy. This is a powerful objection, but it is not the end of the debate. Notice they're saying, they're saying even if you grant this, there still might be free will, and I'll finish this off now. Notice that someone who rejects the argument from design is likely to think both that there is no efficient cause of the complex order which we encounter in nature and that nobody planned the order that we find. But there is no doubt that when a person, say, builds a house, that there was somebody who formed the plan to build the house. That is to say, let's get away from God and look at just people. Um, the question is whether or not that person must have had the power to build it in order to bring the plan to, to fruition. Of course, he had to. He either had to himself hammer the nails or pay somebody else to do it. Reed's point is that our attribution of the wisdom to form the plan goes hand in hand with the attribution of the power to execute it. We might think nobody was either wise enough or powerful enough to create the world, but if we do think someone was wise enough, then we must also think that person powerful enough. In the case of plan conduct, we know that there is a person wise enough, namely the person whose plan it was, so surely we must also think that person powerful enough. As he puts the point, every indication of wisdom taken from the effect is equally an indication of power to execute what wisdom planned. And if we have any evidence that the wisdom which formed the plans is in the man, we have the very same evidence that the power which exerted it, executed it, is in him also. Um, even this point, that where there's wisdom, there's power, can be questioned. But there's surely something right about it. Now, this, of course, is not quoting Thomas Reed. This is the encyclopedia saying Thomas Reed had this point correct, or at least substantially correct. Traits of character, of which wisdom is an example, are both cognitive and volitional. We think of a person who has one as both capable of understanding things and of, and of doing them. To be wise isn't just to know how to do something, but to be able to do it also. So when we ascribe someone with intelligence to think up a complex plan, and on those grounds, take the person to be wise, we are also taking the person to have the power to execute the plan. This is the idea that drives Reed's third argument for moral liberty. That's a pretty good one. Anyway, I thought, notice that the design argument is at least as old as Thomas Reed. People who say this was made up in the 1970s when creation suffered a, 
creation science suffered a catastrophic defeat, and so they tried to go around it by talking about intelligent design. Well, they're not being quite fair. Notice that the comeback includes unguided evolution. Darwin, that reminds me of the quotation, Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. That is one reason why intelligent design gets such a violent reaction from a substantial share of the scientific community. And I might add, people who argue for the first, uh, for the first cause don't get that same, argue, they don't get that same uh, uh, violent reaction. That quote that I gave you is even more interesting in this context. Remember that Reed is a contemporary and opponent of Hume. This is the full quote. An atheist before Darwin could have said, following Hume, I have no explanation for complex biological design. All I know is that God isn't a good explanation, so we must wait and hope that somebody comes up with a better one. I can't help feeling that such a position, though logically sound, would have left one feeling pretty unsatisfied. And that although atheism might have been logically tenable before Darwin, Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. And so, if Darwin is wrong, atheists are going to have to go back to being intellectually unfulfilled. Notice all of this stuff together. The doctorates in science are called PhDs. Science is, in fact, a branch of philosophy. It's natural philosophy. Notice that Agros intends to make an end run around evolution. Even if evolution is true, my argument still works. As far as unguided evolution goes, I think that's a fool's errand. I think we need to recognize that the acceptance of unguided evolution is not, in fact, mandatory. In fact, belief in unguided evolution is a philosophical choice increasingly against the evidence. Then, if we, if we make that recognition, there will be no need to, for weak and defective arguments such as that put out by Agros. And I'm not picking on him personally because there's a lot of people that agree with him. That's why I'm bringing it up. In fact, Agros uses the design argument himself in an unfocused way. In a chapter which is entitled, Which Comes First, Intelligence or Unintelligence, he starts out saying, just over half a century ago, Whitaker Chambers wrote an autobiography entitled Witness. The book recounts his life as a communist spy, his subsequent rejection of communism, and his testimony against Alger Hiss. His repudiation of communism coincided with his conversion to Christianity. Among the many episodes that lent impetus to his conversion, one in particular stands out for being surprisingly commonplace and for producing an effect on him seemingly all out of proportion to, with the event itself. Here's the story in his words. And again, now he's quoting Whitaker Chambers. I date my break from a very casual happening. I was sitting in our apartment on St. Paul Street in Baltimore. It was shortly before we moved to Alger Hiss's apartment in Washington. My daughter was in her high chair. I was watching her eat. She was the most miraculous thing that had ever happened in my life. I liked to watch her even when she smeared porridge on her face or dropped it meditatively on the floor. Those of you who have parents, this will bring back memories. Um, my eye came to rest on the delicate convolutions of her ear, those intricate, perfect ears. The thought passed through my mind, no, those ears were not created by any chance coming together of atoms in nature, the communist view. <coughs> the materialist view, Dawkins' view, for that matter. Um, they, could only, they could have been created only by immense design. The thought was involuntary and unwanted. I crowded it out of my mind but I never wholly forgot it or the occasion. I had to crowd it out of my mind. If I had completed it, I should have had to say, design presupposes God. I did not then know that, at that moment, the finger of God was first laid upon my forehead. 
That's Whitaker Chambers. And if we skip down to the end of the chapter, we get. Dawkins also quotes the famous quip of Bertrand Russell, who, when asked what he would say were he to find himself face to face with the Almighty, inquiring why he had not been an, why he had been an atheist, replied, Not enough evidence, God, not enough evidence. But the evidence is all around us. One may, but need not, peer through a microscope or telescope to find it. One may find it in commonplace things such as the delicate convolutions of the ear of Whitaker's daughter. That is a design argument. So Agros makes them too. In fact, it might be interesting to note the story of the most prominent modern philosopher who converted to Christianity. Recall that Thomas Reed is famous for shifting his emphasis as an apologist from proving God's existence to the task of showing that it is rational for one to believe in God's existence. The same thing happened on the other side. Antony Flew is famous as a philosopher for arguing that, uh, for arguing for the presumption of atheism. That is to say, atheism is a default position. You have to show evidence that there's a God. It's not enough to say, well, we can just assume God, which is a mirror of Reed's argument. In fact, not quite precisely. He tries to claim the middle. If there's evidence for and there's evidence against, we'll go with the evidence against first. Anthony Flew later stated, I think that the most impressive arguments for God's existence are those that are supported by recent scientific discoveries. I've never been much impressed by the Kalam cosmological argument. That's a relative of the first cause argument. And I don't think it has gotten any stronger recently. However, I think the argument to intelligent design is enormously stronger than it was when I first met it. Um, that's, uh, this is found all over the internet. It's an interview by, with Gary Habermas, but that's one reference you can find it at. And he goes on to say, it now seems to me that the findings of more than 50 years of DNA research have provided materials for a new and enormously powerful argument to design. And of course, he followed that argument into theism. Now, quoting from uh, Philosophy Now, where he wrote an article, he said, it has become inordinately difficult even to begin to think about constructing a naturalistic theory of the evolution of that first reproducing organism. The weak link is the origin of life. Notice that what convinced Flew that there's a God is the argument to, and then from, intelligent design. He was not persuaded by the first cause argument or any of its permutations. Agros's attempt to find a substitute for idea is okay, but eventually founders on the history of philosophy. Who designed the designer, at least in my opinion, is not an adequate design substitute. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Go ahead, Ariel. That there must be a first cause is a premise that uh, the argument from for God exists. Uh, but that is a deductive statement. How do you know? that there must be a first cause. You're assuming that causality is universal. Well, actually, what it's saying is that there are three possibilities. Either you can have circular causality, or you can have infinite chain causality, or you can have the cause goes back and it stops somewhere. And uh, I'm not sure that I can make a really good case for infinite chain causality. Um, I think I can make a good case for circular causality, in which case the, the, the choices that were given, uh, it is at least theoretically possible that you could have uh, mutually causing causes. 
And so the chain doesn't have to go back to a first cause. Uh, now, I think it does, but I think that the, I think that the argumentation that's used does, is, is flawed on that point. You get to the simple question. Why is there anything instead of nothing? Yes. Uh, and, and I think that that's a stronger form of the argument than everything has a cause, therefore there must be a first cause. Actually, you know, what I would do, I think, if it came to that, I'll give it to you in just a minute. Uh, what I would do if I came to that kind of a discussion is I would say, okay, so you believe <coughs> things and just kind of pop into, uh, into being from nothing, no particular reason. Isn't that poof? So why do you criticize us if we say that uh, life on earth popped into being from nothing? In fact, our nothing isn't really nothing. It's the word of God. Uh, I, I would just raise this question. Is it sound to use causality to demonstrate on causality as a first cause? Uh, well, I don't think so completely, yeah, and that's I'm one sure. of the reasons why I, yeah, I think um, that although I like where his argument is going, I believe the moon has lots of oxygen in it. That I'm not willing to accept the premise that the moon is made of green cheese. I, I think it's a good question, but I'm not sure that uh, you can find solid basis there. Uh, the more you uh, think yeah. about it, the weaker it gets. The thing of it is, his argument the Kalam argument, none of those arguments convinced the greatest philosoph uh, atheistic philosopher of our times. What convinced him was intelligent design. And that, I think, is why intelligent <coughs> design gets such flack from atheists, is because, uh, as, as one, uh, as one um, <coughs> military <coughs> pilot put it, you know you're over the target when you start getting flack. Romans 1.20, of course, is, uh, fits this very, very, very clearly that uh, uh, God's power is clearly seen in the things that are made. Yeah, and the yeah. reason why th th these people are not getting shot that. at is because they're not over the target. Yeah. The, the scientific community doesn't take philosophical arguments seriously. It takes design seriously because it is a more powerful argument. Um, comment here. I, I was listening to a sermon a few years ago. It was really interesting because I like Newton, even though I don't know much about him. But he said Newton had a college guy that was an atheist, and he's seen Newton's. Um, I guess he made like a planetary thing that has you know the, the orbits, and and his, the guy, the atheist in the college, said. Um, I think the first time he's seen it, he goes, hey, how'd this, how'd this get here, or who's this, or he said something like that, and he goes, oh, well, don't worry about it, you, if you say the universe just happened, or just, you know, the, the Big Bang Theory, or whatever that guy's theory was, and he goes, no, the, the atheist goes, no, this, this is too perfect, it had to have been designed, and had to be created, and Newton said something like, well, that's exactly my case, there ha it has to be a creator, it has to be a designer. And, and I, have, I haven't seen that particular story, so I don't know how accurate it is, but I can say that Newton did say, because it's quoted all the time, this beautiful um, system, I, I can't quote exactly, could only have come about by the uh, uh, action of a supremely intelligent designer or something like that. It, it, you can, it's so that so that whether or not he said that to the atheist, he believed that. Uh, comment back here. Um, <clears throat> yes. Uh, as far as thinking of the first cause, if well, if if something, if there's something that caused something else, then 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 you either think, well, what caused that, or and then you've got you're still tracing the first cause back there, or you're or you're saying can something it, it comes to the conclusion can something come from nothing, 
or was it always there? I mean, that's your choice. It, yeah. th it seems like to me that it's, to me it's, uh, even though it's illogical and there's no evidence of something existing forever as far as we, well, there's things that exist and we assume that they've been here, um, like matter, for an example. You know, it's never, not created or destroyed, that's what science says, right? Yeah. Uh, However, Interest, interestingly enough, we now know matter can be created or destroyed. Mm -hmm. The the claim has or now energy shifted to energy. Yeah, energy. Yeah. But it seems more logical that that there was something here eternally than something that came from nothing, because then you have no no materials, no designer, no idea, no nothing. You know, nothing is nothing. And well, seems in that like case, you would expect chaos rather than cosmos. Well, chaos seems like there's something there, too, <laughs> to, to cause well, all the chaos, you know. Yeah, Otherwise, there's just, if, nothing. If, there's just if, nothing. If it came from nothing, the, the thing that impresses me about the universe is, well, partly that it's there at all, but also partly that what is there looks beautiful, is organized, follows laws. And, uh, and th th I think that the, that the argument from beauty is even stronger in some senses than the argument from existence. Because existence could be by some non you know, mindless... But when you see the artifacts being beautifully designed, you have to think that there's a designer that had beautiful ideas in his mind, however you want to put that. Well, I guess the Bible does say God is eternal. Yeah. I believe. And then it also, but it also talks about the Word being here, and, and also the law was always here, or, you know, like the laws, the laws of the universe. <coughs> you know, there was a certain order that was always here. Yeah. The only question was when it all started, maybe. But yeah. I could comment here. Yeah. And then, uh, Gilbert. Looking at this situation, my, my personal uh, feeling at present is that uh, we have to think in terms of that causality uh, may not be absolutely universal. It is a concept, it's too simplistic for some of the questions we find. And uh, I'm com more comfortable with that than, than trying to say, well, no, uh, because uh, causality is there, therefore there must be a God who had no cause. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not all that happy with that. Well, here's the thing. I think Agros is right in that, that causality is in fact universal and if you don't find a cause for something then it probably was caused by, in, uh, particularly if it's, you know, if it's not only there but correlated beautifully, then I think that it argues for a creator who had an appreciation of beauty. But. But I don't think that you can make that an ironclad deduction. Exactly. You, is that, that is not a, a, a in deductive statement. That, that, that is an is, inductive statement. Yeah, that it is in fact, it requires a certain amount of faith. And there are some people who either cannot or will not put themselves out to have that much faith. And, um, you know, it, it's very interesting because the Bible doesn't say we can prove God. It says they willingly ignore evidence, but it doesn't say they will ignore proof. And the more, even more interesting thing is that in Hebrews 11, it starts out by saying that he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently speak, seek him. And it doesn't even try to suggest that, you know, that's something you can figure out on your own, that God exists and that God cares about me. 
um, that that in fact there's evidence for it but you have to kind of take the step to say I'm going to trust the evidence you can't prove it as usual uh, no. yeah Gilbert and then just, just this comment as usual reality turns out to be so much more complex than our simple minds try to make it that I uh, Right. I think we should not jump at absolute causality as the answer to deep philosophical questions. Yeah, I don't think, I, I mean, it's a, it's a nice argument, but I don't think it's good enough to get you there firmly. And I think that the design argument is an even better one. I'll go ahead and I'm going to pass the mic up. Yeah, I, th I think it's beyond, definitely beyond our comprehension. We've been, you know, there's been science. Uh, modern science in the last hundred years and uh, we're learning that we probably know far less than we than there what it is, what it exists. But I um and it, it, we just simply can't comprehend it. Um so I'm the only answer I can come up with is kind of design what we see and it's strong evidence. How we explain that we're not capable of it. And I think we've pretty much proved that we're not capable of coming up with that answer. And what, to me, has been impressive recently is to think about uh, what uh, Collins said about uh, DNA. It's a language. And then we think of God as Christ as a word. We didn't know what that really meant until the modern 20th century, the last 50 years. I think maybe we, there's more to that than we, we realize, yeah. The whole, the whole universe is made out of information. Yeah, exactly. Go ahead. Um, okay, that C-E-R-N, CERN or whatever, I don't know yeah. what that stands for, but um, do you know what, what exactly, I know they must be spending a lot of money making that big, um, Particle collider, yeah. but I was wondering yeah. what exactly it's, it's how, how how can how can crashing particles uh -huh. take you back in time? Particularly, Are, protons and antiprotons seem to be the favorite one to crash. Uh, well, they're you know they're trying to figure out uh, the underlying structure of matter, and I guess recently they think they've found the Higgs boson. Evidence for it, to be precise. Well, they, they think they found it um, by the evidence. And, uh, yeah, uh, you know. We see the of its right. Well, but that's true. F you know, I haven't seen your brain. But I believe there is one because of the, of the actions that you take and the words that you speak. So, uh, you know, we infer, we infer that there are people and that they have thoughts and that they have uh, choices they make and that they make those choices work because of what we see they do. And I think that we infer God in the same way. And it's not an absolute nail down, but most of us don't really have that much trouble stepping from seeing uh, somebody who looks like a human uh, start talking and, and acting and stuff and, and, and therefore saying that uh, there must be somebody inside, you know. Even though I don't actually see a mind, the mind must be there because it explains what the person is doing. And if we can do that with other people, if we're not all solipsists, then we really don't have any good reason to object that God exists. Or that God can't exist because we can't see him. One more comment and I think we'll close it. Uh, Well, maybe two. Uh, well, I, I was just going to say, uh, the design argument is extremely powerful. I mean, it's, it's uh, 
uh, hard to argue against it when you know the facts and you keep finding more and more complex things, whether it be in... Uh, and you keep finding not, uh, no simple pathways up to those complex things. But the design argument does not answer who caused the designer. You know, the funny part of it is nobody ever argues that. And in fact, I've seen that used as an anti-theological argument. Because, well, okay, so you got design. Now, who do you think the designer is? Come on, come on, who's the designer? And their objection is always, of course, but you can't have God. Yeah, well. <laughs> and there but. you see what the real issue is of why they fight mm -hmm. intelligent design. Intelligent mm -hmm. design does not say officially what the designer or who the designer is. Mm -hmm. But everybody knows where it's going. And the reason they don't mm -hmm. want to go there is not because the intelligent design <laughs> argument is, isn't good enough. It's because they know that if they assent to the design, <laughs> they're going to have to assent to the designer. There's no easy way around that. And the designer, that means problems for me. That's, the well, there, 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 there are several reasons, but that's <laughs> one of the reasons why um, people would not want, would not feel comfortable with an intelligent designer out there. As I've, uh, as I've mentioned uh, before in the years past here about a little incident happened to me in Russia where I was lecturing on the origin of life and at the end of the lecture this girl held up her hand and, okay, okay, uh, who designed the designer? And I, I told her, well now, if a crocodile is chasing me I'm willing to admit his existence long before I know where he came from. <laughs> and uh, I, there's a basic difference here that uh, we must not confuse. Uh, does God exist? Is there evidence for him? Where did God come from? We don't know. But did he that come doesn't. From anywhere? But we, even though we don't know where he came from, doesn't mean he doesn't he doesn't exist. That it's. The problem there is our ignorance. Yeah, no, I, and I agree with you entirely on that. that I mean, that's exactly the answer I would give. Um, <laughs> if I may suggest a way around this problem, um, is because, you see, we are intuitively locked in time. And we think in chronological terms. So we think, if God is before us, who was before God? Or what was before God? Or such things. Yeah. However, John chapter 1, 1 to 3 says, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And interestingly enough, in quantum mechanics nowadays, there are experiments where, where one can consider the experiment from a view in which time is not an important variable. And they call that, and I am quoting, a God's eye view. Isn't that fascinating? <laughs> okay, so, so uh, just one moment, yeah. just one moment. The whole point is that all matter, energy, space, and time are interrelated. If therefore God created any of that, if the Word created any of that, it implies that the Word also created time. Correct. It therefore makes no sense for us to speak in terms of before there was time. There is no before. You well, see, we have no um, conceptual framework to wrap our minds around here. Well, it makes the biblical thing before the foundation of the world, or sometimes this has been said in other places before time began, I that, there, am. that there is an actual, uh, it's not a time meaning to it, but there is a meaning to it that, that is important. And, yes. and the interesting thing is if you march God through time, you are over 
a hundred years behind physics. Because physics realized that, that God does not march through time way back in 1905. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. See if we can close it with this. All right. Uh, well, it seems like to me complexity is just a matter of uh, position maybe because, you know, what's complex to a first grader, for an example, would be maybe simple for a sixth grader or you know, whatever, you, you keep graduating up. It's just, it's a statement basically that we really don't understand. Uh, we don't understand some, so it's complicated. But uh, I think... Uh, well, sometimes we do understand, but it's still complicated because we can't yeah. explain it to our three-year-old. Okay, yeah. Um, but it, like, like you said, you know, who created the creator? Well, a bigger creator or something, you know, a more intelligent creator than you, whatever you, you still get to the same position. It seems to quote like. the lady who talked to Stephen Hawking, it's turtles all the way down. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, that, you know, that, that reminds me of another uh, wise, wise writer here, Dr. Seuss, right? I don't know if you ever, Yertle the turtle, right? He, uh, stuck, well, I was thinking of another one where it was Horton Hears a Who, where the the Who, Whovilles, you know, they don't want to believe in Horton because they can't see him and they don't hear him or anything and they're just on a pile of dust, right? So this is the whole complexity, I think, issue is that we can't see ourselves very well and we can't see who the creator, the watchmaker is because we're one of the cogs of the watch. So it's just our little perspective yeah. of, of things. And, and we need to keep our philosophy very humble because of that. And one of the things we need to be careful of is saying, I know how the universe runs, and it runs this way, and therefore there must be a God. Or for that matter, and it runs this way, and therefore there can't be a God. Because the fact of the matter is, we're not smart enough to figure that stuff out. And the proof is that if we can't run our own lives, our own planet, then we sure probably don't understand how, to, how, how the universe was run. <laughs> That's true. Well, come back next week and we'll talk about red wine and uh, data fabrication.